our machine learning project um, involves implementing a genetic algorithm to um, evolve neural nets to solve flappy birds. So a quick overview of what we did. We found a Pygame version of Flappy Bird. We explored some popular machine learning um, neural network libraries such as TensorFlow, SKLearn, um, but instead we decided to custom implement our own custom neural nets and uh, we implemented a genetic algorithm as well. Um, the genetic algorithm was called Neat and we'll talk about that in a bit. So there are four members of our team, Michael, Brennan, myself, and Nicole, and these are our roles, and we also all um, work together to put together this presentation. So a quick recap of a neural net. So in our framework, neural networks represent genomes, and the key components of a neural net are nodes um, and edges, or neurons and genes, respectively. Nodes receive inputs and then they calculate some output via an activation function. So the features of a neural network include layers. There's an input layer, an output layer, and a hidden layer for a simple neural network, which looks like this. Deep neural networks have many hidden layers. Here's a quick recap of a feed-forward neural network. We send in two outputs, inputs to our network. We normalize those inputs. We pass those outputs to another layer. And we um, calculate a value based on some activation function here at Sysignal. We pass that value along. And then at the output, um, we make some decisions. So here's a quick example with real numbers. Um, we passed in 1 and 5. We normalize those outputs. We send them along, passing them to our next node. And then at the end, we have a value which we make some decision on. So for example, we might say because this value is greater than 0.5, we would tell our bird to flap. So this is kind of how a neural network learns this forward feed. Um, it generates an output, which is normally then compared against an expected output. Um, and based off of that difference, there's a back propagation through the network which updates the weights such that the next set of inputs that forward feeds through the network produces an output that is more closely aligned with the expected output. Uh, this is the general way for exploring the solution space of a uh, neural network and the problem it's trying to solve. Um, but we're going to go about it in a different way uh, using genetic algorithms. Uh, they're inspired by biological evolution, and they're an iterative process that explores the fitness landscape via mutations to discover the optimal. Uh, there's three components. There's generating fitness using some sort of fitness function, uh, which will measure how fit a particular organism is, especially with respect to the organisms within that same species. And then the selection will select the top organisms from that species, and this is commonly known as survival of the fittest. And then it will replicate amongst those uh, top organisms with a chance for mutation. And the mutation is the key piece which allows it to explore the fitness landscape. And this is kind of a, a depiction of a fitness landscape um, in which an organism is a circle with uh, two key features, the size and the circle color. Um, and the fitness would be a measure of the circle size and the circle color. So as a quick demonstration, consider there's a circle world in which a uh, number of different circles are randomly generated that have different colors and different sizes. And for this, we've picked a optimum color of yellow and some optimum uh, size for the circle. And applying the general um, genetic algorithm in which it selects the top fittest, it uh, replicates those and then passes those progeny on. Um, through this iterative process, the population converges upon an optimum, which is the yellow uh, circles with a particular optimized radius. Um, so as you can see, these peaks in this fitness landscape are explored through mutations, um, and the local optimum are found through the mutations. So why are genetic algorithms a good idea? Um, as Michael mentioned previously, oftentimes um, a neural net will have labeled data that it can use, and therefore it can use backpropagation to train. 
Um, but for this example, we don't really have such labeled data. Um, and instead, we use this fitness function or train our neural net or our genetic algorithm. Um, another thing is that uh, typically, uh, genetic algorithms are pretty good at solving uh, problems when you don't actually need to find the global optima, but you just need to find a solution. And um, that's where they really shine. So um, NEAT is a, stands for uh, a neural evolution of augmenting topologies. And it differs from tweens, which stands for a topological weight evolution of artificial neural nets. Um, and basically, it stands for when there's a difference between a fixed topology or an augmented topology. So with NEAT, we allow um, more complex structure, meaning an addition of neurons and genes, um, to arise. So existing work out there, uh, such as MarIO, solves a deterministic landscape. And so what I mean by this is uh, it solves the first level of MarIO, where the map is always the same and the enemies always follow the same pattern. Uh, but we wanted to know if NEAT would work for more of um, a random game. Um, or for an element of entropy. So our hope is that um, an equivalent of MarIO with a deterministic landscape would be like uniform pipes occurring. Um, whereas if we have random pipes, we want to know if um, using the, using this genetic algorithm can overcome that. So as Ali was saying, neural networks have inputs and outputs. And in our case, we needed to pass inputs that would optimize the problem of solving Flappy Bird, which involves passing through all of the pipes the bird encounters. We concluded that the best inputs to have were the bird's centered xy position and the opening of the pipe centered as well in xy coordinates. We initially wanted to have the four corners of the pipe openings, but we realized that the network was ultimately converging on the centers anyway, so we just passed that to speed it up, and we had one output, which was whether the bird should jump or not jump. We also had a fitness score, as Michael was saying, which was a linear combination of the number of pipes the bird has gone through, its total energy expended, which is its number of flaps, the distance it's traveled, and the vertical distance from the pipe opening, which was able to scale it more towards the center to be able to achieve passing through the pipes better. And these are two fitness functions that we found tend to work the best with our system and gave us the best results. And we modified Flappy Bird to have either uniform or random pipes, as shown here. And our final modification was that we added many birds, which represented different organisms in a species. And Brennan will talk about that more right now. So the way that a genetic algorithm is set up is it consists of organisms, like Ali mentioned previously, um, are these neural nets. So each Flappy Bird is represented as a single neural net and a single organism. Um, and then we have species which kind of represent a collection of organisms that all share roughly the same structure. Um, and generally, you'd have a different species if your structure is different enough to warrant having that different species, such as a more like a hidden layer or a couple of hidden neurons. Um, so you have a collection of organisms for each species, and you'll have a collection of species. And a generation represents just a single iteration um, of running the species against the Flappy Bird Pi game. Uh, and so the whole idea for, for fixed first augmenting topologies is that the problem with fixed topologies, as you can see uh, from the diagram on the right, is that if we just have a single hidden layer, um, it blows up how many connections we have. And this leads to a really large search space because it takes so much time to find um, the optimal weights just by initializing them randomly um, that it leads to slow or potentially impossible convergence. Uh, and secondly, it's just unnecessary complexity. So um, the solution to solve Uniform pipes, for example, does not require all those connections. It doesn't need that complexity. Um, so NEAT's approach is to start off with the most simplest neural net possible, just your input layer and a single output neuron or output layer. Um, and the idea is that you only would create additional connections or additional neurons um, if the need arises. So anytime you create a new gene or a new neuron, if it survives selection, uh, meaning if it continues on, that means it actually was representing an underlying truth or an underlying um, derived feature that needed to be there. Um, so the first part is selection. So we have each of our um, organisms or birds go and play the game. They score um, some fitness function representing how well they did relative to one another. Um, and again, survival of the fittest. So the top half will live on and the bottom half will die off. Um, the ones that we first we rank all the survivors in order of their fitness and then technically a champion is crowned. And so after we do selection, we do replication. So this means that we need to repopulate um, for the next, for, we need to repopulate the species for the upcoming generation with new genomes. Um, so you always copy over the champion of the previous generation just to maintain the best genome that's ever ran. Um, and apart from copying over this champion, you have roughly 25% of your genome for your upcoming generation um, are created from cloning. Um, and the other 75% are created from crossover. Um, cloning, as you can imagine, is where we choose a genome randomly from the survivors using this skewed distribution 
Um, and what this is, is that we have a higher probability of selecting um, the more fit survivors and a lower probability of selecting the less fit survivors. Um, and then with crossover, you choose, again, two random genomes using the same sampling technique to make them together to create a new child progeny. Uh, and after we've created all the genomes for our upcoming generation, we'll iterate through each genome individually and apply some mutation to them, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So the importance of crossover is that it introduces variability into the population, which allows it to explore the fitness landscape and find out uh, more of the optimums that are closely uh, related to the current species uh, optimum. Um, but there's a problem in this with competing conventions in that there's more than one way to express a solution to a weight optimization problem. Um, so consider if there were two networks um, that were encoded in a way in which the order of the genes which evolved were not tracked. So you could have two different topologies that have the same solution, uh, parent one and parent two. And then if you were to cross over, uh, you run the risk of losing a, a gene that tracks an important feature that was derived. So in this case, B would be lost. So it produces an offspring with one gene A and two gene Cs, and B was lost. So this would likely be a lethal mutation in which the, the bird would lose some feature detection for the pipe, and it would fail immediately and it'd be killed off. Uh, so a solution is to implement innovation numbers, and this allows us to track the genes um, and their evolution over time, and they're unique numbers um, that correspond to a particular connection between two neurons, and these innovation numbers are tracked uh, globally. Uh, so as an example, we chose a genetic encoding uh, demonstrated here where each genome is comprised of genes. Each gene has its unique innovation number, which is listed at the top. And then the number, or the input neuron and the output neuron, that that gene represents the connection between. So if you were to have two parents with different topologies and you were to cross them over, uh, there's three important categories of genes. One is when they're matching genes, and that's when parent one and parent two share the same innovation number. It's the same connection. Uh, the second and third are disjoint and excess genes. Disjoint genes are where parent, one of the parent's genes fall within the range of the innovation number of the, parent, the other parents, but they don't match. And then excess are where they fall outside of that range. So the scheme that we used was when they match, then the offspring has a 50% chance of inheriting either parent one or parent two's gene. Uh, when they're disjoint or excess, the fitter parent passes those on to the offspring. And that's how we are able to carry out the crossover. So after we've uh, created all these genomes for our upcoming generation for a given species, we'll iterate through each genome individually and apply some mutation. Um, so there's two main categories of mutations. There's weight mutations and there's structural mutations. Um, and weight mutations consist of two subcategories. Um, the first is changing the gene weight. So we iterate through every gene for a given genome you have an 80% chance of changing that gene's weight. And there's two ways to do that. If you decide to change the weight, you have a 10% chance of giving it a completely new random weight, or you have a 90% chance of making a small uniform change to the current weight. The other weight mutation possible is that you can either disable or enable um, a gene. And then the way that more complex structure and neurons are added is through these structural mutations. So you have a 5% chance of um, adding a gene between two existing neurons in the neural net and you have a 3% chance of adding a new node. And on the right, you can see what happens during this node creation, that um, you take, you select a random gene, you disable it, and then you create a neuron in its place with two of the genes connecting the previously uh, disabled genes neurons. Uh, and it's important to notice that the weights here, um, one of the weights, or one of the genes will have the weight of the now disabled gene, and the other uh, gene will have a weight of one. And this is important because it minimizes the effect that adding this new node has on the actual structure of the neural net, um, so it can still maintain roughly a decent um, optimal approach while it continues on. Um, and so speciation is one of the most integral part of this algorithm. And basically, if you were to have a neural net and it added complexity because it added a new neuron or a new um, gene, it takes more time for more complex neural nets to optimize. And therefore, if we kept it in the same species, it would die off against the more simpler neural nets during selection. It wouldn't make it past selection. So what happens is if a neural net evolves um, structurally enough to be different, it needs to be given a chance to optimize, so it's taken out into its own species. Um, so at each successive generation, we'll iterate through the genomes, and we'll look at each genome and see if it's compatible with its current species. If it's not, 
will reassign to another species if there exists a species that it is compatible with. Otherwise, we'll create a brand new species entirely. Um, and so to determine compatibility, this goes back to looking at the historical um, structure of where these genes arise from. So we look at things like excess and disjoint genes, as well as the average gene weight difference between the two genomes we're comparing. Um, and as you can see here, we normalize against N, and N is representative of the structure uh, or the size of the neural net or genome that we're looking at. And you can understand this because if we add a neuron to a very large neural net, it's not as much of a change as it is if we add a neuron to a very small neural net, in which case it is a very different change, so it should be speciated out. Um, the second thing we have is population control, in which species, you have a, you have a constant population across this whole algorithm um, of N, for example, and you want to distribute this population across all your species. So typically, species that are starting to perform well will be given more of the population. Um, and lastly, you can also kill off species or cull species, and this can happen in two different ways. Um, in one way, you can stagnate, which means um, a given species might continue to converge to a um, local optimum but never actually find a solution, meaning perhaps it can always get past the first pipe, but it can never find out how to get to the second pipe, in which case after n generations, if there's no improvement, we'll kill off the species. And the second way to do uh, species culling is if the population is too low, meaning it was never assigned enough population to continue, then it probably wasn't doing any well, very well, and we'll kill it off that way. And then this is an example of the neat algorithm learning. And you can see species tracked in the upper uh, right-hand corner. And species 3 will be very erratic because it hasn't had time to optimize, whereas species 0 will actually solve it this time um, because it only needed a very simple structure to solve this simple problem. So here are some results that we found um, for our fixed topology genetic algorithm. That is, we have one hidden layer with five uh, neurons in it. Uh, we can solve the deterministic pipes problem completely, but it takes quite a long time because, again, as Brennan said, it has a big search space. And it can solve, it can do random pipes pretty well, um, but again, the time is very long. So here it is solving random pipes. And then um, here are some results for our implementation of NEAT. Um, we can solve deterministic pipes as quickly as three generations. Um, and it can uh, do very, fairly well on random pipes in less time. And for this random pipe problem, speciation occurs more often than it would for deterministic pipes, because again, we're trying to solve a more complex problem. Um, because this is a, a rocky landscape, there are multiple solutions to this, uh, this problem, and so here are many different ways in which uh, birds can solve the deterministic pipe problem. Each one looks quite different. So some challenges we encountered in implementing our project, again, were that we were not ultimately able to fully solve random pipes using me, and this could be a combination of many different things, including not having the correct inputs or fitness functions, or we just did not tune our parameters correctly, and you can see these on the right, and these are things like the mutation rates and crossover chance in probability. So in summary, for this project, we rebuilt Flappy Bird in Python, we implemented a custom neural network, we implemented a fixed topology genetic algorithm, and then we implemented NEAT to compare it to that. We struggled fine-tuning our parameters, and we did have success with deterministic pipes, just like the developer of Mario. So again, we showed that NEAT is able to solve a deterministic system. And we were able to achieve some success with random pipes, which means that NEAT is possibly able to solve mm, random systems by using a slightly randomized genetic algorithm. And finally, we'd like to give acknowledgments to Dr. Chris Kettleson and the Computer Science Department at CU Boulder.